Well, we're in the final sermon of the series, and we've been asking this question for three weeks. Would you desert the gospel? And today we finished that series. Have you been thinking about that question? I know I have. And we, in, in thinking about this question and looking at what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 1, 6 through 12, Along with that, we've also been talking about this movement that's gripping churches and Christians and people called deconstruction. And last week in your notes, I provided this quote for you. If, destruction, if deconstruction is simply rethinking what you believe, engaging your doubts or asking hard questions, declaring war on it would be mean. Because we have doubts, and we need to engage those doubts to find answers, to ask questions. Tim Barnett said deconstruction is not about getting our, your theology right. It's not about trying to make your views match reality. It's about tearing down doctrines that are morally wrong to you to make them match your own internal conscience, true, authentic self, or whatever else is being called these days. And it's scary. They don't want to lean in and talk about and discuss what Scripture actually says. They would rather lean in and listen to those things that, like Paul said, tickles the ears, that match with what I think is morally right and wrong, that match up with how I think I should live my life. And this is a movement that comes out of a philosophy called postmodernism. In postmodernism, everything is relative. Truth is relative. Morality, ethics are reality, are relative. And with this new deconstruction and de-churching, the gospel becomes relative. That means that you can define it for yourself. And what you believe the gospel to say and what you believe the gospel to be will be different among each of us. You know, apostasy is not new to the church. In fact, we can go to the letters of the Apostle Paul and read all about apostasy. In 2 Timothy, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he talked about how there was a man in the church that traveled with Paul but has left the church altogether. So this isn't new. The names may be different, but what people are doing, the apostasy that arises, is nothing new. Carl Truman wrote, the church has been aware that there are those whose profession of Christianity, while often powerfully expressed in the moment, proves weak and transient in the long term. And I've witnessed friends and colleagues and people I know go through this process, powerfully express this belief, but many of them are transient in that they jump from one belief to another as they believe God is drawing them to something else. We're going to see this morning that the gospel is by no means relative. We don't define it for ourselves. God does. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, these are the two verses we're going to lean into this morning. This is our text. If you have a chair Bible, turn to page 778. If you have a Bible in whatever form, we'll be in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. 
For I would have you know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel which was preached by me is not of human invention. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for the message God has for us today? Cool. Let's, get, let's dig in. So I, the first question that came to my mind as I began to think about this passage and look at various key, what I thought were key words and what God might be revealing to me, the first question that came to my mind is what does Paul want them to know? And we read that word know and, you know, we think knowledge or, or wisdom or, or gain. True, yes, it, it, it has that. But in the first line, Paul wants them to know about the reality of the gospel that he preached. And that's what that word know is telling us. We're dealing with reality here. Here's your first fill in the blank. More specifically, that the gospel is real. I don't know how many times I've heard it said, the gospel story. That's not a bad thing, but what happens when you think of story? Well, the Zeus is a story. Dionysius and the resurrection ceremony for that Greek god is a story. Gentiles, the churches of Galatia, they were Greeks. They were Romans. They were very much aware of these stories and the pantheon of Greek gods and Roman gods. And Paul says, I want you to know that the gospel is real. It's not a made-up story. But also with this statement, Paul wants not only the Galatians, but anyone who reads this letter to know that truth. That's us. All of these Thousands of years later, as we are engaging this morning with what Paul is saying, he wants us to know the very same thing. But what makes Paul's gospel so real? Why is it not like the gospel of the false teachers, the good news of Zeus and, Play, and, and uh, Pluto? The reality is that the gospel preached by Paul has no human origin. It didn't come from man, nor was it taught to man by man. Paul says, in Gal- says that in Galatians 1 and verse 11, For I would have you know, brothers, the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Your next fill in the blank, the real gospel does not come by man. In fact, man has nothing to do with it. Well, gee, that removes any feeling I have about it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. The gospel is not influenced by mere human considerations as it would be if it was of human origin. The gospel doesn't care about how, you, how it makes you feel. The gospel doesn't care about what you think about it. The gospel doesn't care if it steps on your toes. Because it's not about you. Doesn't this say a great deal about the gospel preached by those influenced by the world's considerations and people's emotions? More concerned about how people feel than they are about the reality of the gospel. Well, Paul would tell us it tells you the origin of their gospel. Their gospel is of human origin. It's created by man. And therefore, what Paul does with verse 11 is give certification to the gospel he preached. And notice the certificate. The certification isn't signed by man. 
It's signed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So how, how was Paul taught the gospel then? How did he learn about it? Well, that's verse 12, isn't it? Verse 12 says that the gospel he received came by revelation. And that word revelation simply means communication of knowledge to man by a divine agency. That's important. It wasn't a revelation of man. It came by revelation of Christ. So it has divine agency. And revelation is especially communications that proceed from God or Christ. And in the case of Paul and the disciples, it came by Christ. Your next fill in the blank, the gospel preached that Paul preached to Galatia and in all of his letters is about Jesus Christ as king. You know, you think about the Roman world. Caesar was king. Caesar was God. Now you understand why the focus of the gospel that Paul preached was, no, Jesus is king. Jesus, who descended from King David in his humanity and is now enthroned as the Son of God as part of his resurrection. So you see, when Paul says gospel, he has in mind the proclamation of Jesus the fulfillment of the Messiah, God's anointed in the Old Testament, the Messiah of whom Israel looked forward to, and the risen Lord of this world. In Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 2, this is exactly Paul's point, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles in behalf of his name. That's good news. Living in a world where men and women fight in conflict over power and try to come upon us as though they are king. They are in charge of our lives. They tell us what to do and how to live. And Paul would remind us as he did the Romans and as he's trying to do the Galatians, in all of that, remember who is king of kings and lord of lords. The next fill in. The gospel is not about how I feel or what I think. The gospel is about the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And Paul reminds them that he was taught this by Jesus himself. And it's actually kind of interesting because it isn't more that he was taught more literally, he came to know the gospel because Jesus revealed himself. That's really what Paul is saying. It isn't that, you know, in, in Acts, when, when he's on, in Acts 9, when he's on, 3 through 6, right? The Damascus Road conversion, it's often called. It isn't that we didn't get that Jesus revealed the gospel and taught the gospel to Paul at that moment. What, he, what Paul and what that is saying is that because Jesus revealed himself, Paul understood the gospel. Because he saw the resurrected Lord. Remember, he knew the Old Testament. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. He knew all about, inside and out, the prophecies of the Messiah. And when he, re when he witnessed, saw the revealed, resurrected Christ, it's like everything came together. And because he saw Jesus, he knew the gospel. This revelation completely changes 
Paul's life. He goes from murdering Christians to saving Christians, to saving people. And in this revelation, we learn that the gospel is about changing people's lives, not accepting or affirming people's lives. In fact, to bring that point home, Paul uses what's called a triple negative. There are three negative statements of the Apostle Paul in these verses. The first negative, he says, not of human invention. This is a denial explained by the next two negatives. The second negative, neither received it from man, and third, nor was I taught it. So Paul establishes the gospel of God's grace does not have human origins, and this has to be understood. It's not about what we humans want or desire. In fact, it has little to do with our desires. It has nothing to do with our desires. Your next fill-in, the false teachers in Galatia knew that if they could undermine Paul's apostolic authority, they could defeat his gospel message of God's grace. That's the other reason for the triple negative. That Galatia needed to understand that these people were trying to discredit Paul and his message. And Paul's saying, my credentials didn't come by human origin. The gospel that I presented to you is not human. But it came through Christ. And Paul responds to this by establishing the origins behind the gospel he preached. Just think about the gospel for a moment and what it involves. No human mind apart from God's revelation would dream up a plan of salvation wholly dependent upon God's grace and death of his son. Where it isn't anything about what I do, but it's all wrapped up in what somebody else did for me. Do you really think humans would come up with something like that? And would require the death of someone Paul would say no, because it's not human. The gospel was part of God's plan. So we take this all in. Paul's saying a lot in two little verses. How should we respond to all of this? Well, as I think, as I go back to verse 6 and bring myself to verse 12, I think about what Paul is saying. And what I think, though not expressly stated by Paul, I think is implied in the statements of Paul. The danger of neglecting the gospel. And I remember what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 2, verse 1. For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every violation and act of disobedience received a just punishment, and listen to this, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed by those who heard. God also testifies with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Fill this in. We need to understand just how important and urgent the gospel is to people. And and when people dismantle it or try to discredit the true, real gospel, it loses its urgency. The gospel is supposed to be good news that leads people to repentance. 
a fancy word that means leads people to a complete change of life. But the gospel that was preached in Galatia and the gospel that, that we hear in our world, in our colleges, people we may know, doesn't require life change. It affirms all these different lifestyles. I'm not saying that we need to hate them, but we can't affirm it either. We cannot affirm their gospel. Why? Because it's not real. That's what they need to hear. Not some fancy two and a half paragraph explanation. Just simply what Paul said. Their gospel is not real. Because the true gospel deals with life and death. For those who accept it, it's good news. And they follow Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 54, remember what Paul says here. But when this perishable puts on imperishable, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to know the gospel so well. I had somebody ask me this week, well, what is the gospel then? Well, it's not very hard. And in eight verses of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us. And you can, as we saw this morning, you can go to other passages as well. But here's, here's the takeaway from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. That's a, that's a passage that I would highlight, underline, put in my notes that I need to refer to that. When I need to remind myself of what the gospel is. Here's what Paul says the gospel is. First of all, the gospel was of such importance that he delivered it to them first of all. And what was the message? What's the good news? Jesus died according to the scriptures. That Jesus was buried and resurrected just as scripture said. And Jesus was witnessed alive by many. Peter, and then all the 12 apostles, And in another instance, Paul says, by over more than 500 brethren at once. And he rounds out, and last of all, by me, by Paul. Let me ask you an obvious question here. What part of that has anything to do with you? What part of what I just said, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8 says, has anything to do with me? Did it mention anything about me? No. Paul says, the good news is Jesus. The good news isn't that Jesus affirms anything. The good news is what Jesus did. Your next fill in, a a perverted gospel comes from a place of finding acceptance of desire and emotion. That's where this messed up, perverted gospel that we hear comes from. What did John say in 1 John 2, beginning in verse 15? Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. The gospel that's perverted, the gospel that we're being introduced to in Galatians, that we hear and read and see in our world, is all tied up in the world. And John says, 
The love of the world has nothing to do with God. Right? The gospel, the perverted gospel, has nothing to do with God. Well, then what does it have to deal with? Me. I. 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 Those are the statements. I like what it says. I like how it makes me feel. I like that it accepts me for who I am. I like that it reminds me that God loves me. Where's Jesus in all that? God does love you. But because he loves you, he requires you to change your life. And he knows you can't do it by yourself. That's what Jesus is for. The definition of the gospel is not from human minds, but comes directly from the mind of God and written down on the pages of Scripture. It doesn't need human help to be understood. As we wrap up, we are witnessing the fastest seismic shift religiously in the United States. Roughly 40 million Americans have stopped attending church. That's huge. A part of this, people are deconstructing and dechurching. Their deconstruction to find something that fits with their life leads them right away, right away from Christ. And many just quit church altogether. In seminaries, across the board in seminaries, students starting to want to begin their journey as a pastor, de-church, deconstruct, and leave altogether. And churches and denominations are struggling to find pastors. And yet, where's the voice of the church in all of this? Why aren't we speaking out and speaking up? And, the, and there isn't one church or one religious organization or group that's untouched by this movement. We have to ask ourselves, would I desert the gospel? Because Paul says that's what they've done. They've left their post. Let me ask the question another way. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Some seem to be ashamed and are willing to make compromises and changes so that the gospel is more appealing to society the world doesn't need a candy-coated gospel. The world needs the unadulterated truth of the gospel of God's grace through Christ. For only in that can one experience the meaning of the invitation of Christ. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. In all things have been handed down over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son determines to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke is comfortable and my burden is light. The gospel is about Jesus and the forgiveness of our sin by the grace of God by our repentance. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, thank you for the real gospel. And make the gospel real to us. So that when we read page, pages of scripture like 1 Corinthians 15, it sinks deep and, and it just affirms what we know to be true. And the knowledge that we know, Father, isn't from us. We know it's from you as your spirit teaches us. And Father, only when we can do that is there any way that we can share the good news with others. We're saddened by the direction that so many are taking in their lives. And Father, if, if us or if someone else could speak into that, if you could speak powerfully into that, Bring revelation, Lord. Bring, bring us to those people to learn again the good news. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.